Thank you guys all for coming out so early. I know it was a struggle for me to get here. Um, what I want to do today is to talk about what I think is the next big coming thing in computing. And I've called it embodiment. And I'll explain in a minute what I mean by that. So, oops, wrong way. Um, when one is thinking about what's going on, what's going to happen in computing, it's always prudent to start with Moore's Law. Um, and I just put up, you've probably all seen these numbers many times before. They tell you that the computing and the storage, the, mem the memory and the disk storage and the, and the land bandwidth and everything uh, improves exponentially with a doubling time on the order of one to two years. Uh, and the implication, there are a couple of important implications of this. One is that it makes sense to spend hardware resources to simplify software. And the other one is that um, having better hardware enables qualitatively new and different applications that were just not possible on earlier generations of hardware because they needed more cycles than were available. And the third implication, which is what gives rise to constant hand-wringing about the software crisis, is that more and more all the complexity of any system is pushed into the software. And naturally, complexity is the thing that's difficult to handle, and that's what tends to make software difficult. Um, but it's still the best place to put the complexity, because even though it's difficult to handle it in the software, it's easier to handle it there than anywhere else. Okay, so um, in thinking about what's going to happen in the next decade or two, um, I thought it was good to ask from a very high level, from orbit, so to speak, uh, what computing is good for. And computers started out being used for simulation. Whether you were, you were simulating nuclear weapons or simulating payrolls, the basic idea was the same. Starting about 1950, you build some kind of model of something that you're interested in the behavior or properties of in the computer. You run the model, and then it tells you something about what is going to happen, or perhaps what did happen in the past or whatever. So today we simulate protein folding, and, and we use simulation for games and virtual reality and lots of other things. And this started in night, around 1950, and it's still going strong, and it's certainly going to continue. Um, I'm going to put the emphasis on things that are new, but that doesn't mean the old things are, are going to be unimportant. It doesn't mean that new and exciting things aren't going to happen in the domain of simulation as well. So about 30 years after computers got started, around about 1980, we started to use them for communication. And it wasn't that people hadn't thought of using for computer, computers for communication before, but you needed um, hardware resources that didn't, didn't start to become available until about 1980. So that's brought us email and online airline tickets and, and online books and movies and Bing and Virtual Earth and Twitter and all kinds of wonderful things that, that you know and love. Well, it's been another 30 years since 1980, and my view is it's about time for something new. And I think the new thing is going to be what I have been calling embodiment. And what I mean by that is non-trivial interactions between computers and the physical world. So automated factories, cars that drive themselves, robots, uh, so-called smart dust, sensor networks, all kinds of things. I'll give uh, a number of concrete examples, some of them of, of embodied systems that are deployed today, and some of them of embodied systems that won't, we won't have for another uh, 15 or 20 years. Um, I discovered recently that the National Science Foundation is into this, and they've given it the unlovely name of cyber-physical systems. Only a bureaucrat could think of that. <clears throat> okay, so just a couple of examples. I'm um, here simulating protein folding. Um, I just grabbed this out of a, out of a paper a couple of years ago. Um, you have this complex structure of, of atoms that make up a protein, and you want to understand how it takes a three-dimensional shape and use computers to, to simulate the energy profile. Um, communication, lots of different things. Email is not that interesting to look at, but here is uh, <clears throat> Windows Live Local. Uh, showing a map which happens to be an aerial view of the neighborhood around my house in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and you all know all the great things that have happened as a result of our starting to use computers in a big way for different kinds of communication. Here's one of the first examples of interesting examples of embodiment. I've been predicting for about 20 years, maybe 25 years, that the next decade would be the decade of the household robot. And it was a complete bust until about five years ago. <clears throat> but now we have the Roomba, which, of which several million have been sold. It's not entirely clear that the Roomba has staying power, but at least they did manage to sell several million of them. This is a little robot vacuum cleaner. And, and I don't think this is true anymore, but I learned from Rod Brooks 
who uh, designed and I believe programmed the first Roomba, that uh, it sold for $200. That means it has to go into the container in China for $40. That's the rule of thumb. And, so you and it has some fairly expensive components in it, like a fairly hefty battery, for example. So the computing budget was 40 cents. You could spend 40 cents on the computing for this thing. It had about 12 kilobytes of ROM and, get this, 256 bytes of RAM. And Rod thought this was the absolute greatest because he believes that robots should be like cockroaches. Uh, I don't believe that myself, and I don't think this is the way to the future, but, but we'll see. Anyway, this thing actually does work. <clears throat> so let's think uh, very broadly about the future of computing just for a minute or two. Um, a lot of people have said and written indeed in, in uh, business school magazines and, and places like that, that uh, the great wave of, of uh, innovation in computing is over, and of course, uh, it's computing is going to continue to be important, but basically it's going to be boring. And I think that that's complete nonsense. And I, I think that um, Jim Gray a few years ago did the best job that I've seen uh, of outlining a set of things that are entirely, I think, conceptually within reach for computing, but that are, and that would have very dramatic consequences for our lives, but that are definitely well beyond the current state of the art. So these are, these are things to, to work on. Um, you'd like to be able to, to pass the Turing test, win the impersonation game. Can you persuade an, a person who can't see either you or the computer? Can a computer persuade a per person that can't see it that it's actually a person? Um, extensions of that, can it read and understand as well as a human? Can it think and write as well as a human? Uh, entirely different class of problems is to make a computer hear and see as well as a person. The current deployed state of the art in that is represented by things like the the uh, gadgets in, in cameras that can pick out faces and make sure that they're properly exposed and even tell whether the faces are smiling. Um, in research, of course, you can do quite a bit more elaborate things. But these are tough problems. My colleague, Rick Zaleski, who's one of the world experts in vision, says that he and he's about 50, and he says he believes he'll be retired before a computer can pick out a kitten in a photograph as well as a person can. It's much more difficult to pick out a kitten than it is to pick out a face. <coughs> Um, you might like a computer to be able to answer questions about a pile of text as well as a human. This, of course, is what uh, search engines do, but they do it in, in a way that's very, very much inferior to what a human can do. Of course, they make up for that by look, looking at a great many pages of text in, in the corpus, but they don't do a very good job on each individual one. And then once you can handle text, you'd like to be able to answer questions about, about large collections of sound and images and so forth. Um, Coming closer to the theme of embodiment, you'd like to use computers to make it possible for you to be somewhere else. So you know, observing the past or interacting with people in the present. That's called telepresence, and that's something that's just beginning to happen. And clearly it has huge opportunities in reducing the amount of traveling that people have to do. Um, here are more systemy things. Uh, find an architecture, a computing architecture that scales up by a factor of a million. Um, the architecture that we have now for personal computers has actually done a pretty good job of scaling, but it seems to be pretty much played out, so we're going to have to take another shot. Uh, for programming, given a specification, uh, build a system that implements the spec and do it, the computer, do it automatically, um, and do it better than a team of programmers can do it. There are some limited domains in which we've been very successful at this particular one. Uh, for example, uh, query optimizers for, for SQL queries. Uh, do a better job than, than almost any uh, human being could do. But that's, of course, a very, very restricted domain. And build a system that millions of people can use that requires hardly any administration. Uh, so I now want to turn attention to a somewhat different class of opportunities. There's some overlap between the ones I'm going to be talking about and the ones that Jim Gray outlined. Um, I want to talk about embodiment. <clears throat> which, as I said, means non-trivial interactions with the physical world. So there's many aspects that this can, this can take on. Um, one class of such, such things involves sensing the world. So today, for example, we have GPS-based traffic information systems where um, lots of GPS-equipped cell phones in cars um, keep track of uh, what streets the cars are on and how, how long it takes to get from one block to the next, and they upload all this information to some, somebody in the cloud who aggregates it all together and gives you very detailed traffic information. And in fact, um, there are systems 
uh, that are deployed, at least in Seattle, that apply machine learning to all of this and they predict what the traffic is going to be like in half an hour based on, on the information about what it's like now uh, plus all this history. Um, spoken commands and dictation is an area where a huge amount of progress has been made. That got started in the 1970s and for many years it didn't make, it, was, it wasn't practical at all because we just didn't, we currently believe that that's because we just didn't have the computing resources to do it. But today we ship uh, command and recognition and dictation in uh, Vista and in Windows 7 and I've used it and it keeps getting better. It's really very impressive. You should give it a try. Uh, I cranked up the Windows 7 version uh, when I got my RTM version of Windows 7 and, and uh, dictated a whole page of text and I think it made three errors in the whole page, which is a lot fewer errors than I would have made if I'd typed it. Um, many of you have probably seen the, the uh, demonstrations of Natal, which is a, a vision system that allows you to give video commands to games for the Xbox and you can imagine when you have a video of that level of sophistication, you can imagine lots of other potential applications for um, <clears throat> using something that's much closer to a view, view of what's actually going on in the real world to control what's happening in the computer. Um, one of my dreams along these lines is meeting room audio that actually works. Of course, at this conference we have meeting room audio that works because we have uh, highly paid professionals making sure that it works. Um, but typically when you go to a meeting you find that there's too much feedback or, or the microphone isn't turned on or who knows what's wrong. Um, a huge number of man hours every year are wasted on this and it seems pretty clear that you could build an, an embodied computer-based system that would sort out all these problems. And, no, and I don't really understand why no one's done that. I think it would have a huge market. Um, An interesting example of, of sensing the world is a, is a project that's been undertaken at, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, England, which is the SenseCam memory jogger. The idea is you have a wearable still camera, which, which has storage for a few thousand pictures. And instead of having a shutter button, it takes pictures continuously. It takes one a minute, and it also takes a picture whenever it thinks that anything interesting has happened, but that the scene has changed in any significant way. So you get this sort of very, very sparse video of what you did during the day. You can play it back later either just by time or you can do a limited amount of scene recognition. And it turns out that it wasn't quite clear what this would be good for, but it turns out that it's invaluable for people who have memory loss. Because when they watch these uh, sense cam records, they remember things which they were otherwise unable to remember and then the memories stick. So I want to play a little video See if it works. This is the first time that I've ever, here we go. Oh, there's no audio. How distressing. Well, here's a picture of the sense cam. And here's the leader of the group that, that built it. Um, I, I hear dim audio, but maybe somebody can do magic back there and make it loud. Um, here's an example of a sense cam record. Um, you can see that uh, and it's got other sensors besides the, the uh, picture. It's, it's got an audio recording and temperature sensing and a few other things. And uh, so here's an example of, of a, a record that you get if you're just walking around the city of Cambridge. Um, and it, as I said, people have been uh, using this uh, to help out uh, patients who have memory loss. So here's an example of, of a record that, that one of these patients uh, made as they were taking a trip somewhere and uh, she's explaining how uh, this woman who has a, a, she doesn't have Alzheimer's, she has some kind of brain impairment um, and she's actually able to remember what happened on the trip um, when her memory is jogged by this thing. Oh, wild excitement. I'm not quite sure what's going on now. Am I supposed to do something? Click on here. That's not very encouraging. <laughs> so she's explaining that, that this has just made a qualitative difference to this woman's life. Uh, here's another example of a trip that, that she took with the SenseCam pictures. 
Um, and here's another uh, patient. This one does have Alzheimer's. Um, and he's explain, explaining that um, he wears the sense cam and he's really un unaware that it's there because it works completely automatically. It doesn't require any attention. Uh, I think his wife arranges to upload the images to his computer and then um, they can review what happened uh, during the day and, and again uh, he finds that things that he never would have been able to remember before he had the sense cam just with this very, very small amount of jogging of his memory uh, makes a qualitative difference to the way he's able to live his life. Uh, so this is I think an interesting example of how far we've already come, the kind of applications that are possible. Um, I don't think that anyone really thought of this at the time the sense cam was conceived. It was conceived of as a gadget. Here's a picture, a close-up of it. <clears throat> it was just conceived of as a gadget. We thought this would be cool, and we found out uh, that you can do these interesting things with it. Uh, if, you're in, if you want to find out more, you can go to research.microsoft.com slash sense cam. Um, something that we don't have yet, but that I want very much, and I'm pretty sure that I'll be able to have within the next five years is a personal contact reminder. I have a terrible memory for people's names and faces. And what I would like is a gadget that has a little camera like the sense cam, although I think it could be made much less conspicuous. And, and uh, there's gonna be a little uh, button, a wireless headphone in my ear. And uh, when I walk up to someone, if I don't immediately say, hi, Bob, it's gonna whisper in my ear that, you know, that's Bob Brown and you met him last three years ago and so on and so forth. And this is going to re just re revolutionize my interactions at meetings like this, where I'm constantly running across people who recognize me, and they, they expect me to recognize them, but I can't do it because my, my uh, memories, my brain is just defective in that respect. And it turns out um, in many of these embodied applications, there are interesting interactions with cloud computing. Uh, I discovered that some of our cloud computing people are actually working on this gadget. And I said, what's this got to do with cloud computing? And they pointed out to me something that should have been completely obvious, which is that uh, by taking advantage of, of all the information that's in the cloud, I can recognize lots of people that I've never met as long as all the people, as well as all the people that I met last week. So uh, this will be very cool. Uh, here's another example um, of something that exists today, but only in prototype form. It's really a toy. It's a hint of what, what's going to be possible. Unlike the sense cam, which is not a product, but it's much closer to being real. Um, there's a computer that has a camera and a microphone array, and it has a world model of a set of limited tasks. Uh, so it has some knowledge of objects it should be able to recognize with its vision system. It has some model of scenarios that it understands. We're going to see a concrete example in just a minute. And it's capable of a limited amount of natural dialogue with people. So the example that we're about to see is a, is a receptionist, which can recognize groups of people who walk up and ask for simple things that receptionists can do, like, like can you order me a, a campus shuttle? or um, I'm here to see so-and-so. Uh, an interesting thing about this system is that uh, I think it would not have been possible to build it five years ago. Uh, not just because there weren't enough computing cycles, although that's probably true, but because it uses some very big components that do vision and speech understanding and so forth that didn't exist in a usable form five years ago. And today, at least in a research environment, these components do exist, and you can build on top of them. And they're they're not exactly of product quality yet, I don't think, um, but they're good enough that you can actually build a system that can have users, in a, at least in a research context, uh, on top of these big components that do these rather, rather large tasks. Um, I think when, when um, the technology that's in the Natal vision system is an example of such a component that's approaching product quality. <clears throat> and I think this is going to make a qualitative difference in the kind of systems that it's possible to build. Uh, it used to be that you would work really hard just to build the vision system and then you were played out and you couldn't actually uh, use it for anything. But that's changed. So here we have um, what, what the, the uh, people who, who made this called situated interaction. Uh, you walk up to the robot receptionist and as I said, uh, the computer has vision and, and a, a pretty good microphone system and it's capable of, of uh, picking out the faces of people that are walking up to it. Here, the, in that picture, the image was annotated with the computer's idea of what's going on. Um, so the computer can recognize that those two people are, are a group and, and that they want to order a, sh they can, they want to order a shuttle. Uh, it can recognize that a third person, whom you'll see coming up in a minute, uh, is from a different group and, 
and a computer is capable of switching its attention from one group of people to another. Uh, and it can under understand what you say as long as it's not very complicated. <clears throat> so there it is, recognizing these, these two guys and uh, recognizing that this is somebody else. <clears throat> So there they are, the two guys. Uh, they're asking for the, for the shuttle, and the computer saying, uh, is that really what you want? You might think, by the way, that the, the, the um, avatar of, of a human being, that you, they, the, which is the way the machine is manifesting itself, is very crude. Of course, we could have done a much better one, but that was, it was a deliberate choice to make the avatar crude, to reflect the fact that there's not a real person you're talking to. Uh, and the range of things it can do is extremely limited. Uh, so. I, as I said, this thing is a toy, but I think it's a very interesting uh, demonstration of what is starting to be possible. So let's move on. Um, looking a little farther into the future, uh, a few years ago, there was a big fad for grand challenges in computing research because people thought that, and with some justification, they thought that with a, with a grand challenge, you can get more money out of the government. Um, and they invented grand challenge. They had a bunch of workshops. and a lot of discussion and invented a bunch of grand challenges that I thought were very boring, um, like a teacher for every learner. Um, that'd be a wonderful thing, but we have no idea how to go about it. So it's not very satisfactory as a grand challenge. My idea of that, the, the sort of um, prototypical good grand challenge was, was sequencing the human genome, where it was very concrete. You could tell when you were done, and you could see a fairly clear path that requir required a lot of innovation, but nonetheless, it wasn't magic. <laughs> So my grand challenge is to reduce highway traffic deaths to zero. And my view is that this is a pure computer science problem. Um, because to solve it, cars have to drive themselves, at least in emergencies. We already have all the necessary uh, sensors, and mainly in the form of cameras, and all the ne necessary computer control of the mechanical systems of the car. So it's a pure programming problem, which we're very far from being able to solve, by the way. It's going to need computer vision. It's going to need world models for roads and vehicles and the behavior of pedestrians and all kinds of things like that. It's going to have to deal with the uncertainty that unavoidably arises from, from the sensor inputs, the performance of the vehicle, and the changing environment. The program is not going to know everything about what's going on any more than you as a driver know everything about what's going on. And of course, it's going to have to be pretty dependable in order to be deployed. So other people have had this idea too. And for the last several years, uh, DARPA has been running a series of uh, challenges for autonomous vehicles. And the one that they ran most recently, which was two years ago, was they called the Urban Challenge, which was to drive uh, around in a small town. Of course, they didn't actually have a small town, but they had an abandoned army base, which turns out to be indistinguishable from a small town. <clears throat> um, so they, did, they ran it very much like a sports car rally. Uh, you were given, the carts were given a set of, um, or a sequence of destinations that they were supposed to pass through. The whole course was about 60 miles long. Um, and there were, a, there were about 100 entrants originally. Um, they did a lot of weeding out, and they had 11 finalists for, the, for this particular uh, task of, of the 60 mile course. Of the 11, more than half succeeded in finishing the course, which is pretty impressive. Espe especially in light of the fact that in addition to the 11 robots, there were about 40 other vehicles on the road uh, driven by uh, stunt men who were um, sitting, and the cars were especially reinforced with, with steel cages around the driver in, ca in case um, something, the robots did something bad, which in fact they didn't. There were a couple of, of very low speed collisions, but nothing very, nothing very bad happened. So here's a couple of pictures of the cars. You can see they look kind of weird because it turns out they, they didn't actually use cameras as the primary sensors because that's still too hard. Um, they had these laser rangefinder gadgets, which are spinning um, arrays of mirrors that, that sit on top of the cars. And that, those are the funny things you can see poking out. So here's uh, a video which I assembled out of a bunch of components. This is a picture of the small town. Uh, and here are some cars doing things. <clears throat> these are just vignettes. Here's like a complicated intersection. Um, the robot is making its way through the intersection. This is the finish line. No, sorry, this is a parking maneuver. Um, just a few more shots of cars doing things. Uh, there is a somewhat complicated negotiation at a corner. And in a minute, uh, we're going to see the finish line. You can see that one of the cars was an impressive looking truck. 
That was that, that uh, lime green thing. Uh, here we're going to see a, a maneuver at an, up, in detail, we're going to see a maneuver at an intersection. So the, the robot is pulling up to the intersection. There are some other cars stopped there. Um, now a couple of the other cars are going to go. Here's one coming straight at us. Now the one on the right is going to go. Uh, then the one on the left is going to go, which you can't see, but you're, you will see it in just a second. There it is. And now the robot is going to make a left turn because it's figured out that it's the robot's turn according to the rules of four-way stop signs. Now we're going to see the same th thing from the perspective of the robot's sensors. So here's what the robot thinks is going on in the world. It's pulling up to the intersection. Uh, and you can see the other cars. Those are the red blotches on the roads. Um, this is the information that the robot is getting from its laser rangefinder gadget. Well, there goes the first guy. Now the guy from the right is going. Uh, now the guy from the left is going to go. And finally, the robot is going to make its left turn uh, following the green line, which is the tra trajectory that it's worked out for itself. And finally, we see the finish line. Cars pulling up to the finish line. Lots of people are cheering. And that's that. So this was actually, I think, pretty impressive. You can see that this is still a long way from being deployable. But, but I'm, five years ago, I predicted that we would have cars that drive themselves in 20 years. And now I'm predicting that we're going to have them in 15 years. So it's going much better than the household robots. <clears throat> so what do we need for cars that drive themselves? And I think you know, this is a, a stretch application for embodiment. But it, it's a very exciting one. From both from the point of view of the lives that are going to be saved by improved safety and also the fact that you can now read the newspaper while you're commuting instead of having to drive. It'll be great. We need computer vision, we need world models, and we need two things that I want to talk about a bit in, in the rest of the talk. Um, one of them is uh, we need much more systematic ways than we have of dealing with uncertain, uncertainty because it's unavoidable when you're interacting with the physical world, that there's going to be uncertainty. You're not going to have perfect information about what's going on. Your sensors are limited. They have noise. Um, if it's a camera, there's occlusion. Um, lots and lots of things hap happen that, that you're not going to have perfect information about. Now, human beings have learned to deal with this uncertainty in rather, compl <laughs> rather complicated ways that we don't fully understand. Um, and the computers are going to have to learn, too, not necessarily using the same techniques that people do. But that's an essential component that, that plays a pretty small role in almost all computer applications today. But it's going to play a, a very big role in embodied applications, uh, except to the extent that you can just unload the uncertainty on the people. So in the sense camp, for example, they don't have to deal with this at all. Um, they're just taking the pictures, and they're showing them uh, to, the, to the users. And it's the user who decides whether that's useful or not. The machine is not trying to figure out anything about what's going on. The other thing we're going to need besides dealing with uncertainty for many of these applications, not all of them, but many of them, is a high degree of dependability. And it's pretty clear that that's the case for the, for the car application. And I'm going to talk, talk about that at some length later on because it's a topic that, that I know a lot about technically. So, but first I want to say a little bit about dealing with uncertainty. So uncertainty is unavoidable in the physical world. And in order to deal with it, one of the things you need is good mo models of what is possible. And then you, the way you, the sort of the high level way in which you attack the problem is you take the, the uncertain inputs from the sensors and you use them to drive the models. And you, and you ha have a, a two way dialogue between the sensor information and the model, which allows the machine to make sense out of what's going on. And the other thing you need, of course, is none, these models are not going to be perfect, uh, so you need boundaries for them. So you, for example, you're going to have models of what, um, of the behavior of cars on the road, but the, those models are probably not going to take account of the possibility that some, uh, somebody goes crazy and drives their car off the road and through a plate glass window. When that happens, the, the right thing to do is, I think, for the foreseeable future is for the computer system to throw up its hands and say, I don't understand what's going on here. We better stop. Um, so uncertainty is unavoidable, not just for um, application, applications like the, uh, like the robot cars, but also for any kind of natural user interface. Um, if you're going to use speech or handwriting or, or natural language as an input to the computer system, it's unavoidable that the machine is going to have to guess what the meaning is. It's not the same as moving the mouse up to some place 
to some button and clicking. Um, there, it's quite unambiguous what you did. It might not, might not have been what you meant to do, but there's no doubt about what you did. That's not the case with natural user interfaces. So the machine has to guess what you did. And a fundamental problem that you have to address when you're doing natural UI uh, is what are you going to do if, if the machine guesses wrong? So that's another aspect of this, of this dealing with uncertainty. And of course, you also, the machine is also going to be guessing if it's a robot car, and certainly you have to have a clear story about what you're going to do when those guesses are wrong. So let's just look at one concrete example of, uh, of, of um, current methods of dealing with uncertainty. Um, if, you build, if you're trying to build a speech understanding system, like the kind of horrible system that um, people increasingly make you deal with when you call customer service or, or call airline reservations or whatever, um, there's things going on at various levels. There's acoustic input, which is a waveform, which, which is the combination of the actual input speech and some amount of noise that's coming from various sources. Um, you process that wave, waveform and you extract what are called features in that game. And you can think of this as a form of compression, where you cut the bandwidth down from, from uh, 50 kilobits per second to, to maybe a couple hundred bits per second. Then you look at these features and you try to extract phonemes. You try to put the phonemes together into words using a dictionary. Um, you try to put the words together into phrases using a, some kind of a notion of how words go together into phrases, which is called a language model in the trade. And then uh, if you're doing dictation, you're done. But if you're trying to, to do um, speech understanding, now you have to extract meaning from these phrases. So for that, you need a model of the, what's, what's called a domain mo model. Which, um, so, for example, if you're, a, if you're in a reservation system, your domain model consists of airplanes and, and flights and, and uh, people's itineraries and things like that. And at each stage in this process, there's uncertainty. And, and what you're trying to do is produce a result which is um, optimal or at least plausible, taking account of all the uncertainty at all the, at all the stages. And, and, and at each stage, you have something some information that helps you to reduce the amount of uncertainty. So for example, when you're putting the phonemes together to make words, you have a dictionary of English words if you're recognizing English. And that, that helps a lot to cut down on the uncertainty. If you didn't have that, it would probably be hopeless both for people and for, for computers. I certainly find, for example, if I go to, to Greece, um, the Greek alphabet is written quite differently than ours, although the basic sounds are for the most part the same. And I can't remember the street signs that I read because my brain hasn't learned how the Greek letters go together into words in the way that it learned how the Roman letters go together into words when I was learning to read at the age of five or six. And the computer has the same issues. Um, let's look at another example and more superficially. If you're trying to build a robot, the robot has to be able to answer a whole bunch of questions. Where am I in the physical world? What's going on? What am I trying to do? What should I do next? What just happened? Um, and you saw the car, cars dealing with this set of questions in the video. Um, so I think in order to really make progress in this domain, we're going to need some new paradigms for dealing with uncertainty in programming languages. And I don't really know what those paradigms are, and I don't think anyone else does either. It seems, seems as though the basic notion that you ha have to be able to traffic in is probability distributions. And, and could we find a way to have distributions as a standard data type which, of course, you'd have to parameterize over the domain in the same way that you parameterize collections. Um, what kind of operations make sense on, on distributions? Um, there's a small start in this direction th that's been built in Microsoft Research. It's called Microsoft Infer.net, which is a, a collection of, of classes and, and stuff that allows you to de deal with uh, uh, certain ways of modeling uncertainty. If you're, and if you're interested in this kind of thing, you might want to, to check it out. So, I don't know that much about handling uncertainty, and I'm not going to say any more about it. I know quite a bit about dependability, and I'm going to spend the rest of the talk uh, um, sketching out what I think we know about dependability and what it's got to do with embodied systems. Some, for some embodied systems, of course, dependability is not very important. Um, the SenseCam application, uh, if the SenseCam stops working, uh, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, it's a mild annoyance to the, to the user, but it's no worse, maybe not even as bad, as having some 
existing application on your PC stop working. But if you want to do the robot cars, of course, dependability is critical. So what does dependability even mean? Well, people have been studying this question for about 40 years. And we have very good formal answers to this question. Formally, it means that the system meets its specification. And we know how to write specifications for more or less arbitrary systems. Um, and we, know, we have the necessary theory to, in principle, show that the implementation actually meets the specification. Unfortunately, this is not very practical most of the time because it doesn't scale very well. So if the, if the code is more than a couple thousand lines, uh, you probably won't be able to, to carry out this process, even though in principle we know exactly how to do it. A more serious problem is that we usually don't know how to write the formal specification properly. Um, we can get partial specs right. Uh, Randy Bryant has a great slogan for, for his work on model checking, which has been, been a, a narrow aspect of this that's been very successful. Um, he says, I prove small theorems about big programs. So we have tools that can actually uh, prove that your program, for instance, is never going to dereference nil. Um, and it, those tools can work on pretty big programs. But for the most part, the viewpoint we have to take is not so much um, we've shown that this thing is really going to always work as, I'm sorry, uh, I looked hard and, and I found 23 bugs for you, but I can't find any more bugs. And we have quite a bit of tool quite a large repertory of tools now that can do that kind of thing, beginning with type checkers and going on to th tools like prefix and prefast and, and lots of other things that are floating around. And we're making steady progress in that domain. But I think it's pretty clear that for most purposes, um, this is uh, only a small part of understanding uh, how to make a system that's dependable. Informally, what it means for a system to be dependable is that the users aren't surprised. And of course, whether the users are going to be surprised or not by the behavior of the system depends on what they expect. So it's, it's very instructive to com <laughs> compare the dependability of the 1980 AT&T telephone system, landline telephone system, with cell phones. Um, the dependability standards that AT&T set were extremely high, not, by the way, mainly for technical, it was mainly for economic reasons that they set those standards so high. It wasn't that there was really market demand for such a highly dependable system. When cell phones started out, they were, were several orders of magnitude, at least three orders of magnitude less dependable than the landline phone system, maybe more. But people regarded them as a completely different animal, and so they didn't ask for that level of dependability from a cell phone. Now, over time, of course, cell phones and landlines have converged, and one of the consequences of that has been that people's expectations for the reliability of any kind of phone system are substantially less than they used to be. So we put up with, with uh, phone systems which would have completely outraged the AT&T engineers of 1980, but they don't bother very many people today. Um, the market often doesn't work very well for dependability because it, it's hard for people to evaluate how dependable the system is. They tend to focus on, on major disasters. So for, for instance, a few years ago, the, the British railroad system had two or three extremely well-publicized crashes. And as, as a result of that, they put a program into place to improve the safety of the rail system, which by at least some calculations was going to cost close to a billion dollars for each life saved, which is actually not a very good investment. You can save lives much more cheaply than that by spending the money in other ways. Um, the other obvious thing to say about dependability at a high level is um, how do you measure it? Well, it's the probability of failure multiplied by the cost of the failure. That's what you care about. So how much dependability uh, do we have? Well, it varies a great deal. Fundamentally, most of the time, it's as much dependability as the market demands. Uh, which, when, so for the British rail system, it was de demanding an outrageous amount of dependability. For cars, we have a pretty high standard. Um, for web search, we have a much lower standard of dependability. Certainly, we don't like it if the search engine d doesn't return any, anything, but we have no, no effective way of ev evaluating in the short term, we have no effective way of evaluating the, the quality of what it, what it returns for any given query. Almost any amount of dependability is possible if you limit the aspirations sufficiently. So people work very, very hard, for instance, to build highly dependable uh, software for the space shuttle. Um, and they work almost as hard, although not quite, to build highly dependable software for commercial airliners. Um, and for other things, we work much less hard. Um, if you want the thing to be very dependable, you have to be prepared to pay, both in severely restric restricting what the system is expected to do and also in spending a lot of money on engineering. How much uh, 
dependability do we need? Well, it varies, safe, but historically, um, dependability has not been that critical for computer systems, um, but safety critical apps are growing pretty fast, and the fundamental issue there is what's the value of a life, and we don't really know how to answer that question. Um, there's an interesting relationship between dependability and security. Um, sometimes people just lump in security. <laughs> Security is one aspect of dependability. But, but a better way of thinking about it is that whenever you, you want to characterize the behavior of any system in the face of various adverse circumstances, you have to have a threat model. And it doesn't make sense to say, I'm going to have an arbitrary threat model. Uh, there's no doubt that any system that you build has a property that if, the, if, the, uh, if you have an adversary and the adversary has succeeded in getting in there and hacking the gates that constitute the, the implementation of the computer's instruction set, you're going to be in trouble. So you better, most people don't put that in their threat model. Um, and, but this applies across the board. If you want to really understand what's going on, you have to have a clear no notion of what kinds of threats you aspire to deal with. And to say I want to deal with all threats is just a recipe for, for failure. Um, I, said, I said if we want to make progress on dependability, like it's like anything else, you have to be able to measure it. So you need to understand the probability of failure and the cost of failures, and this is a sketch of different uh, ways that you can, you can approach those things. Um, and the fundamental issues from an engineering point of view tend to be what's the budget for dependability and who gets fired when things don't work. And more so, I think, than in many other aspects of systems, um, these are areas where what people say and what they actually do diverge enormously, uh, especially when it comes to the question of who gets fired, because often you don't find out what the deficiencies of the system are for several years, and by that time, the people who are actually respon responsible uh, have gone on to other jobs. And if you believe that that doesn't have any effect on the decisions that they take, um, that's, that's really very, very naive. Oops, wrong way, sorry. Um, so the most common way in computer systems to get dependability is through redundancy. You make multiple copies of the system and you arrange for some kind of failover scheme. And we've learned uh, a lot about how to do that. And it's very good in its place. I'm certainly not going to knock it. But for it to work, basically you need independent failures. And usually for software you can't get this. So the classic example of this is the failure of the Ariane 5 European uh, rocket. Um, we, which on its maiden uh, launch self-destructed after 40 seconds. And it turned out the reason for that was there was a long complicated chain of events which you can read about if you search for Ariane 5 disaster on the web. There's an excellent report of the accident board that was convened afterwards. But the, the uh, immediate cause of, the, of, of this was that there was an overflow in a floating point to integer conversion which raised an exception that wasn't caught which caused uh, the inertial navigation computer to shut down. Probably not a good decision, but that decision had not been taken casually. There were two inertial navigation system computers, of course, but they both encountered the same bug, and so they both shut down, and so then there was no information about what the rocket was doing. And after a short time, it said, well, if I don't know where I am, I better self-destruct, because who, know, who knows what might happen, and that's what it did. Um, so independence is a, is a tough thing, and of course it's even harder for specifications uh, than it is for, for code. Uh, Tony Hoare said the unavoidable price of reliability is simplicity. It's very, very difficult to get people to, yeah, yeah, to buy this um, when they're, when they're um, writing down requirements. I heard a disturbing presentation three or four years ago from a guy who was the chief software program officer for one of the new Air Force fighters, I can't remember whether it was the F-22 or the F-35, um, who said that he knew that the requirements that had been laid down and agreed to by everyone were not achievable. And he was in charge of the software and he couldn't do anything about this. So this is not the whole answer for sure. Um, here's another way of looking at dependability. Instead of trying for a system that always does the right thing, let's try for a system which never has a catastrophe. And the primary motivation for taking this tack on things 
is that it's a realistic way to reduce aspirations by forcing you to focus on what's really important. So what is a catastrophe? Well, it's something that has to be very serious. You have to have some kind of numeric measure for it, I think. So for example, if you're running, if you're try, trying to figure out what, what to do for counterterrorism, um, plausible measures might be the number of dollars lost or the number of lives lost uh, as a result of some terrorist act. And you better set the threshold pretty high. If you say, I want to make, make sure that no life is ever going to be lost to terrorism, um, that's not achievable. Um, there's no question that the bad guy walking down the streets of New York with an explosive vest strapped around him can set it off and kill 10 or 20 or 30 people. Um, it's more achievable to say that we're not going to have airplanes driving into skyscrapers anymore. Um, another slant on a numeric measure is rather than saying, I'm going to measure um, a catastrophe by the size of the, of the problems that it causes, you can say, I'm going to measure it by the size of, of the part of the system that is supposed to guarantee that there won't be a catastrophe. You might call this the catastrophe computing base by analogy with the idea in computer security over the trusted computing base. Um, because it's only a fairly sm small thing that we can have real confidence in. And um, of course, a fairly small thing can't implement a huge uh, um, list of complicated requirements, so you have to cut way back. So um, let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, a very famous one is the USS Yorktown. This was an, a prototype automated ship that, was, uh, that had lots of computers controlling many aspects of the ship. And it was cruising around in the Atlantic on some trial voyage. And because of a divide by zero in some application that was running on top of some database system, through a chain of events that wasn't supposed to happen, um, they couldn't run the engines on this ship anymore. Okay, well, if you're a ship on the high seas and you can't run the engines, that's a catastrophe. Um, because if there's a, at least if there's a storm, um, the chances are the ship is going to sink if you can't run the engines. Um, so that's a good illustration. This system was, was not designed according to the principle that I proposed, which is that you should focus really hard on not having catastrophes and let other, other things um, play a smaller role. Um, we've seen several examples of, of uh, medical equipment, usually involving radiation, that um, can malfunction in ways that cause patients to die. Um, it's been um, speculated that if uh, an adversary can hack into the control system for the power grid, they could melt down some big power transformers that would take a year to replace. And that would cause a, a pretty serious disruption in, in people's lives. Um, an interesting question is wh whether there are any catastrophes that are computer only. Um, with the exception of the loss of crypto keys on this list, none of these catastrophes are computer only. They all involve interactions with the physical world. And, and I was part of a group of people that, that made a fairly serious effort to answer this question. It seemed pretty plausible that there aren't really any computer only catastrophes. It can be a sig if you mess up the computer system, <laughs> System, it can cause a substantial amount of inconvenience, but that, that's probably as far as it goes. Um, I think for the purposes of what I'm talking about here, which is trying to under, understand dependability of embodied systems, um, there are some misleading examples. Uh, not that these examples aren't important, but that they cause you to focus on things that, I, in my view, are not central. Um, a lot of work has gone into uh, software for avionics uh, driving the plane, and for nuclear reactors. But these are pretty atypical for two reasons, I think. First of all, quite a lot of stuff has to work. And secondly, it's very difficult to shut the system down. Um, in many systems of, more, of immediate interest, uh, those things are not true. For example, one of the things that the robot car has going for it is that if life gets too complicated, you, ha you have a fairly clear, relatively simple, fairly quick path to, to, um, to escape, which is to, to pull over to the side of the road and stop the car, and then let somebody else figure out what should happen next. That's not an option if you're the software that's flying the plane. Um, it's also very important not to set impossible goals. Um, never lose a life. 
That, that might be a reasonable goal for a, a piece of medical radiation equipment, but it's no good for driving. You know, I said reduce highway traffic deaths to zero, but that's a marketing slogan. If we can reduce them by 90 percent, that, that would be fabulous uh, in, in practice. Having no terrorist incidents is not a realistic goal. Having no downtime in your system is not a realistic goal. If you set goals like that, the result is just going to be that this thing's not going to work at all. Uh, and we saw a spectacular example of that with the FAA um, new air traffic control system about 10 years ago. So they wrote a spec that said that a controller workstation should only be down three seconds a year. There was no actual requirement for that. I mean, the controller workstations they have now are down for hours every year. Um, but w when you write a spec like a, that, it completely distorts the engineering of the system. It makes a hopeless mess. Um, catastrophe prevention for the electric power grid is not very good today. It has all kinds of security flaws and problems. Um, trusted computer bases for security have pretty much been a bust. Um, no one's figured out a way to make the trusted computing base small enough to be, to be sensible. Um, so my view is that if you take, a, if you take this approach to, to um, dependability, um, the fundamental issue is architectural. Uh, you have to have some notion of normal operation versus catastrophe mode. And catas when you're in catastrophe mode, you're only going to depend on the high assurance uh, catastrophe computing base. So for example, the Yorktown is a good illustration. Um, the thing that's really critical is to be able to run the engines. So the engines have to be run by a computer system which has the property that, although under normal conditions, it can take input from some big, big complicated fuel optimization calculation. When things get hairy, you have to be able to cut it off from that because, because you don't really know whether that's going to work or not. You have to be able to drive the engines in a very simple-minded way. It doesn't mean that computers can't be involved, but the total amount of code has to be quite small, and the interface to it has to be quite simple. You know, um, you get to set the engine speed, and you get to turn the rudder just, the, just like it used to be in the old days when you had a wheel. Um, so catastrophe mode requires clear, limited goals, limited functionality, and very strict bounds on complexity. So you might take the view, for instance, that the CCB shouldn't be more than 50,000 lines of code. You know, we could argue whether it should be 20 or 50 or 75, but if it's a million lines of code, you're not going to be able to have high assurance that it actually works. A consequence of all this is that catastrophe mode is not a retrofit. You have to design it in from the beginning. So examples of what it can do, you can do a hard stop. Um, catastrophe mode for a radiation machine is going to have a, a last minute check that you're not delivering too, much, uh, too many photons or, or protons or whatever they are to the, to, to the patient, and it's going to have a very small, simple thing that at the last minute can say, okay, we're not going to, we're going to turn the beam off. Um, soft stop driving a car, um, I think you can see that the task of pulling the car over to the side of the road and stopping it is a lot different from the task of, of driving in routine situations, and similarly with the ship engines. Um, so there's a variety of different ways you can imagine for how you might implement this. Um, and there's a variety of different techniques. Uh, um, for, uh, for getting to catastrophe mode. You can reboot the system, discarding corrupted state and starting from a clean state. You can shed load, you can shed functions, you can run the, the CCB as an isolated thing that has veto power over critical decisions. And, and a variety of other uh, things like this, uh, all, all of which have been used many times successfully, in, perhaps in less critical systems. Um, we can learn a fair amount. Yeah about dependability from our experience with security. The most important thing to learn is that in this world, we can't achieve perfection. The best system is the enemy of the good system. So the most critical thing is to set reasonable goals, not to set goals that are actually not achievable. And the second thing is dependability is not free. Um, customers are capable of understanding the trade-offs, although I, I think market exp experience suggests that for various uh, um, well and various reasons that are not too hard to understand, they tend to undervalue the total cost of ownership because it's somewhat difficult to measure and only plays out over several years. Um, like security, dependability is holistic. You have to look at the whole system. And like security, dependability is fractal. If you look harder, you can find more problems. So you have to not do that because if you keep looking harder and harder and find more and more problems, you'll be paralyzed. Um, so just to wrap up, <coughs> Um, if one is thinking about the future of computing, 
the most, a very important thing is to understand Moore's law and what its consequences are going to be for what it's possible to do. Uh, you all know that it's important in general to aim for mass markets. We have computers everywhere. And my view is that uh, simulations are going to continue to be very important and productive and uh, the source of a lot of uh, good things for the world and a lot of revenue. Communication is going to continue to be very important and productive and, and have those same properties. But the great new thing for computers is going to be embodiment, non-trivial interactions with the physical world. And of course, there's a lot of things you have to do in order to achieve successful embodied systems. They come in many different <laughs> flavors, with many different levels of, of difficulty in engineering. But I think the two most central things are going to be learning how to deal with uncertainty and learning how to avoid catastrophes. Of course, if you look for embodied systems where, no, where catastrophes aren't possible, like the sense cam, um, the second one is much easier. OK, with that, I think I'll stop. And I could take, take some questions. Yes. Uh, yes. What impact do you think embodiment has had on artificial intelligence? Well, of course, it's a two-way street. Many of the techniques that are used grew out of work in AI. Um, one of the things you have to understand about AI is AI is always in a mess. And the reason for that is it's the same reason why philosophy is always in a mess, which is whenever anything is successful, it gets spun out. So, you know, vision used to be part of AI, and it isn't anymore. It's, a, it's its own field with its own conferences. Um, and the same thing is true for, for uh, speech recognition and, and uh, machine learning and, and many other things. Uh, just as mathematics and physics and linguistics got spun out of philosophy, these things have gotten spun out of AI. So you have to be quite careful about how you think about it. But, but definitely, uh, embodiment has always been an important goal for AI, AI and continues to be. Hi, is this thing? Yeah, that's on. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a little response to uh, something that had been written about the concept of the Internet of Things. Yeah. The idea that if we connect everything together, you, me, the chair, the fridge, your wristwatch, uh, a rerun of Hogan's Heroes, that suddenly problems that we hadn't solved before would come to solve themselves. Almost, almost like your, your example earlier of understanding when uh, you had uh, a personal camera that's attached to the cloud. Why would I want that? Somebody said, well, it's obvious. Uh, because then you'd have an entry to the database of millions and millions of names. You could identify people you've never met before. Oh, that's clear. I hadn't seen that before. Well, I ended up getting into kind of a, an argument with Vint Cerf about this because he was one of the guys who's, who coined the, the concept of Internet of Things. And his argument was, well, once you connect everything together, you dummy, you'll understand the problems that we're here to solve. So let's put these connections together uh, and just go for it. And my feeling was, how do you create a system that is supposed to become embodied without knowing in advance what it is you're embodying? Don't we need to have a better understanding of the problem well, before we add yeah. new problems to okay. it? Well, it's good to think about those things. But on the other hand, we have a lot of experience with computers and computer systems that tell us that we, we aren't smart enough to understand these things in advance, and we need a lot of trial and error. So I would say go both ways. Uh, a deep, deep thinking about what you want to accomplish and what's possible is a good thing. But a lot of experimentation is also a good thing. Uh, you know, you can say that it should have been ob obvious what the application for the sense cam was. But I can assure you that I know the people that worked on it, and it wasn't obvious. Yes. You were talking about uh, sensor networks and things like that. We already try to integrate such things in the software that we build. But what we see is that people are quite afraid about system knowing such a lot or gathering such a lot of data about their mm -hmm. lives. Uh, what do you think about issues like privacy? Is, can it be a, a long-term showstopper for uh, things you uh, laid out? Well, my personal opinion is that no, it won't be a showstopper because basically because there's nothing you can do about it. William Sapphire wrote a very, very perceptive column in the New York Times about six years ago um, where he said, people worry a lot about the surveillance cameras that governments and corpora corporations deploy. And they're definitely a problem, yeah. but they're actually a less serious problem 
than the fact that increasingly people walk around with video cameras that are turned on a lot and they post the videos on, on YouTube and other people can mine them. And, and as computers get better at doing that st stuff, there's going to be a lot more effective surveillance from these individual sources than there, than there are from the organizational ones. And the, those are, and the individual ones are much more difficult to regulate. So, you know, I think our views of what we're, how much privacy we can, can have are going to change a lot. Um, I think it's a little hard to predict how it's going to play out. And it's definitely a good thing to focus on, but I think the idea that, that these things are not going to happen because people have so much concern about privacy, I, I, I doubt that very much. In your example for the Ariane rocket, uh, I doubt that it was planned that the rocket would self-destruct. No, it was planned. <laughs> You know, Absolutely, it was yeah, planned. It was planned, and, but it was unforeseen that that... that is, can, could you elaborate on how they could have made that a more uh, resilient system? Um, I can, but, but I can't do it now because we're out of time. So if you want to talk about it after, afterwards, that, that would be fine. It, it's a somewhat complicated story. Uh, or you can read the, the report of the Inquiry Commission, which I strongly recommend. It's very short. It's extremely clearly written. I think it's a model of its kind. Thank you very much.